In the name of the living God, who is creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit. Amen. There's a lot going on today. We've got bluegrass music. We've got Earth Day. We've got Jesus, the Good Shepherd. And we really didn't plan all of those things to happen at the same time, you know, it's just the way it happened. But um, I think there's a connection, and I'm going to try to make it for you. <laughs> Jesus, the Good Shepherd. I mean, when you hear that, when you recall an image of that, I mean, what do you do? You smile, right? Because it's such a pleasant, peaceful kind of scene. And, and there's, in this middle window, there's a, it is depicted. And there's, there's Jesus holding this little lamb. You know, and wouldn't you like to be that little lamb? As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, that's often the image, uh, that image is often used in contemplative prayer as a way to sort of get into the presence of Jesus, is to imagine that you're a small lamb or a small child, and Jesus is holding you safely in his arms. It's helpful. It's peaceful. It can take us to a quiet place. But I've got to give this disclaimer. A good shepherd in biblical times was not a peaceful vocation. It was tough. It was dangerous. It was vulnerable. It was lonely. It was constant. Because that shepherd's responsibility, that shepherd's vocation, that shepherd's life was dedicated towards keeping those sheep safe <clears throat> from animals, which you heard about, from hired hands, from thieves, from people who are going to take advantage of them, and steal them, and take them away and scatter them. Um, and so that good shepherd had to really focus on, uh, on three things. One is a shepherd needs to be attentive. I mean, all the time, eyes open, looking at those sheep, looking at what's going on, um, perceiving it, processing it, being really focused, really focused the entire time on those sheep. The good shepherd, good shepherd needs to be caring so that those sheep will hear the shepherd's voice and respond. That so, that, so that those sheep feel safe, so that those sheep feel loved and cared for. And a good shepherd is connected to nature because the shepherd's out there the whole time and he used to sort of read the clouds, what kind of weather's coming in, um, how, are the, how are the sheep responding to what they sense in the air. Uh, it needs to be wise about nature. It needs to be wise about God's creation. It's not an easy job. Granted, they might find some peace and some contentment in it, but it's a challenging job. And... Um, uh, there's no vacation. There's no, there's no replacement that can come in and give you a break. Well, in 2005, I spent um, two weeks of my sabbatical on the Navajo Nation Reservation. It's in uh, New Mexico and Arizona. And one of the things I did was, of those two weeks, I spent three days on a sheep camp. Uh, the Navajo are famous about being shepherds, and sheep are a big part of their lives. And, um, and uh, so often every family has a sheep camp somewhere out on the plains, on the desert, uh, really sort of rough terrain. And when I was there, I, I spent time in two different uh, Episcopal congregations, but there was one congregation who the, the matriarch of that congregation had a brother who was a uh, who managed their family sheep camp. And uh, I was saying, you know, I'd like to be out there, out there in the desert, out there. And she said, well, go spend some time with Key. He's a, he was about a 70-year-old man, and um, he was the one. He was a shepherd. He was the one that was out there all the time shepherding that family herd of sheep. And um, so I went out there. And it was in the middle of nowhere. Nothing was around. You couldn't see anything, nothing except for the plateaus and just sort of the, the landscape. That was it. Um, 
I was going to, I had a tent and, um, and his house, the little cottage only, you know, slept one and I had a tent I was going to set up. Uh, at, the end of the, at the end of the first day, a uh, windstorm picked, uh, picked up and um, I had to sleep in the car. I mean, it was, I, my tent was going to be blown away. So it was exciting out there. Like, it's sort of dangerous out there. But anyway, when the, on the first morning, Key said, would you like to walk with me as I take the sheep for a graze walk? And I said, sure. I thought this would be a great time to get to know Key, you know, get to know who this person really is. So we got out there and started walking, and um, I asked him a question, and he didn't respond. So he just sort of kept walking, and he was looking around. I asked him another question, and he didn't, he didn't, he didn't respond. I mean, I thought, what is this? I like to have a little interchange here. Let's get something going. And finally he said, I don't talk. I don't talk when I'm shepherding my sheep out here. He said, I have to stay focused. He, he, he named it. He said, I, he didn't use the word attentive, but that's what he was talking about. His full attention was on those 25 sheep during the hour and a half that we were out there. It was interesting. I saw the level of commitment he had for those sheep. The other thing I saw was that uh, those sheep uh, felt cared for. And he didn't, really, he didn't really do much except for really watching them, being attentive. Um, I mean, he didn't run around and shepherd them. There was a sheepdog that did that. And he'd give a strange sound to the dogs, uh, that's the end, and the dog would know where to go and over that way. He would just point. Um, but he, he knew those sheep. Most of them had been born right there on that sheep, at that sheep camp. And he'd given names to every one of those 25 sheep. He loved those sheep. And, of course, they knew his voice. And the other thing... The other thing was that he was certainly connected to nature, like, like, like Jesus out there as a good shepherd, or using that metaphor. He was connected to, na to nature, and he knew what was going on in the skies and on the ground. And connected to nature even beyond that sort of shepherding, because in, in, the, Navajo, in the Navajo tradition, much like, much like biblical times um, shepherding, um, you slaughtered a, a sheep for food. And so on the second day I was there, the family came, about 20 people, children and adults, and he slaughtered one of the sheep for the family to eat. It's the whole pattern of living and dying and living, being connected to nature, and that cycle of life that you find out there, out there on this planet Earth. So, that leads me to the second point. One dot to the second dot. Draw that line. So today is the 48th anniversary of Earth Day. Two years will be 50, 50 years, 50 times we have, we have celebrated this day. And as you fully know, fully well know, that uh, it was established in 1970 to to help us Americans be more aware of the planet on which we live and the way we inhabit this planet and what our practices are and what needs to be changed and how we are damaging this planet and maybe what we could do. And a lot of awareness and a lot of good has come out of that over the past 48 years. It basically focuses on how we humans can be good, even better stewards of God's creation. And it's such an important issue, such an important issue. As I said, the first one was in 1970, and um, it's very interesting that in 1979 we got a new prayer book, you know, new prayer book, 1979 prayer book. It takes nine years for the Episcopal Church to produce a new prayer book. So that, that event in 1970 had an influence on our current prayer book. And in Eucharistic Prayer C, we used that prayer. We used it during creation season last fall, and we've used it during Lent. Uh, you will recognize this language in Eucharistic Prayer C. At your command, all things came to be. The vast expanse of interstellar space, galaxies, suns, the planets in their courses, and this fragile earth, our island home. By your will, they were cre created and have their being. 
Those are the words of the Episcopal Church of that earth. And so it leads us to how can we be attentive, to the first characteristic of a shepherd, how can we be more attentive to the earth? How is our planet thriving? In some ways it is. How is it threatened? In many ways it is. How can we protect it from harm? Good question. How does our belief in the risen Jesus Christ enable and encourage us to care, steward, and love all of God's creation, just like that good shepherd, which Jesus was? And how does our awareness of the earth bring us closer to God? And how can we celebrate God's creation? And you see, the point of this, the point of this is that when we see, when we see all of creation truly as a work of God, then it's sacred. Then we relate to it in a whole different way than if it is simply something that we take for granted. But how do we celebrate God's creation? Well, one way is music. And bluegrass music is a, a descendant of mountain music, which is music that was formed really, really in the Appalachian Mountains, uh, not far from here. Music that was made by English, Irish, and Scottish immigrants, 17th, 18th centuries. That music talked about their lives up there in the mountains, uh, an environment that was probably new to a lot of them but they clearly spoke about and sang about the environment in which they lived and how they made a new life in that new, new forested environment at that time. And their music, mountain music back in, the, back in the old days, talked about their tragedies, their challenges, their loves, their joys, and how they saw the sacred in all that was around them. Not only did not only did um, bluegrass music sort of come down as one of, one of, its, one of its origins, but also folk music uh, of the 60s, American contemporary folk music is what they call it, of the early 60s. Um, that also sort of came from that mountain music that talked about the challenges of life and the holiness of, of nature. So here we go with the 60s story. So, uh, so, you know, I was, I was in high school and college in the 60s, and I graduated in 65. And, and for much of high school, two of my friends, um, Bill and Chuck, and I formed a folk music group. Uh, Bill, Bill played the guitar, and I played the guitar, and Chuck played the banjo. And we, were, we loved it. We thought we came up with a fantastic name for, the, for, the, for us, and we called ourselves the Three Folks. And we played around rotary clubs and that kind of stuff, you know, beauty contest, or whatever was going on in the small town in South Carolina. But we thought that it would be very important. We wanted to. We felt called, well, not by God, but by something, <laughs> to, uh, to sing and to say, offer, our, offer our song to uh, the commencement planners for our, in 1965 for our high school commencement. And so they said, sure. And so we decided um, we wanted to sing a, a, a song about Bob Dylan, you know, I mean, during that time it was Bob Dylan and Woody Guthrie and Peter, Paul and Mary, all that kind of stuff. And so, um, so we thought it'd be really good to sing The Times They Are Changing. Now that's, you know, that's sort of an edgy song for Bennettsville, South Carolina in 1965. I mean, it's about come mothers and fathers and mothers, get ready, you know, and come senators and congressmen, get ready, times are changing, you better shape up and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> so uh, we sang it, we sang it, and we did a pretty good job. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of response. Uh, <laughs> and as a matter of fact, a week after, a week after graduation, I left town. <laughs> I went to uh, Glacier National Park to work on the trail crew and uh, then went to Swanee to college and then worked and then went to seminary and then parish ministry and, and you know, I go back ever so often because I do have roots there. I don't, think, I don't think singing that song made a tremendous impression on the people who heard it. But it did on us because folk, what folk music did for us is it, is it caused us to be more attentive. 
more observant as to what's going on in our culture, especially for sort of naive white boys from South Carolina to be aware of the injustices that exist all around. I mean, it, it was important to us, a part of our growing up, and we appreciated that, and we wanted to share that. Well, if that didn't work so well, we had another song. We had another song that we sang, and it was um, This Land Is My Land by Woody Guthrie. Now, they liked that song. <laughs> they clapped and sang along, and it's a great song. It's a song that celebrates earth. You see the connection? One, two, three. I mean, it's, it, it's a song that celebrates earth, especially this little section of earth that we Americans habitate. And it says, this land was made for you and me. That is a rich line. That means that this land was made for all of us, not not just this group or that group, but for all of us. It had a message as well. As a matter of fact, I want to read this first thing. This land is your land. This land is my... We could sing it, but we're not going to do it, okay? This land is your land. This land is my land. From California to the New York Island, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters, this land was made for you and me. Now, now let me ask you something. What does that sound like? And scripturally, what does it sound like? Genesis, of course. I mean, listen to it. It sounds like God created earth for all humanity to enjoy and take care of. It, it, it almost comes right out of Genesis, creation story. So, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The good shepherd is not selfish. The good shepherd is focused on others, especially others for whom he has responsibility. If Jesus can say that, can we say that we are good shepherds or stewards of this earth and that we lay down some of our accumula accumulated comforts for the sake of God's creation. Can we say that? I hope we can, because now is the time. It's getting more and more critical rather than more and more better. Better, But it's becoming more critical, and that's evident everywhere we turn. I hope we can say that we can sacrifice, give up some of what has made, has made us comfortable so that this planet can thrive. This amazing ball that's spinning through the universe that God gave to us. May we truly know it to be sacred. Amen. <laughs>